Well, now I've been warning you that uh, we're going to come to Kant. Kant, tremendously important figure both in philosophy and in theology. And uh, some several sessions ago, uh, I put uh, on the board uh, the, the list of rationalists, Descartes, uh, Spinoza, Leibniz, and the list of empiricists, Locke, Barclay, and Hume. And uh, these were uh, the rationalists were on the continent of Europe. The empiricists were uh, in the English-speaking world. And they just went on their daily business, pretty much. Uh, for the most part, uh, not be influenced by one another. The continental people rarely uh, read the English uh, writings, and the Englishmen didn't read the continental writings either. And that's pretty much the way it's been in philosophy down through the years. Uh, in the 20th century, you have the existentialists on the continent, and you have the language philosophers uh, in the English-speaking world. So the English Channel has uh, provided a, a, a break, not only between continent and, and uh, islands, but also a break between uh, uh, different approaches to philosophy, different ways of doing philosophy. Now, this uh, division comes to a temporary end, although it uh, kind of opens up again later on, but it comes to a temporary end in Immanuel Kant. Kant is a German, and he grows up in this rationalist tradition. He's a uh, uh, disciple uh, of uh, Wolf, who is... Uh, a, uh, who is himself a disciple of Leibniz. So uh, uh, Kant uh, starts off his philosophical career as a kind of rationalist, but then something happens to him that uh, proves to be kind of traumatic, I guess sort of like Pascal's religious experience. Kant at some point uh, reads a book by David Hume, David Hume. And this is so unusual that a German should read an English language book <laughs> that uh, it transformed Kant's whole way of looking at things. He said uh, it awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers. All right? These were dogmatists who thought that they could uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, all human knowledge based on logical deduction. Hume says no. Uh, even our basic perceptions are suspicious. Uh, Hume had the courage to be skeptical about all kinds of things, skeptical about miracles, skeptical about theistic arguments, skeptical about uh, uh, cause and effect, uh, skeptical about substance, skeptical about the soul. And uh, boy, uh, <clears throat> I mean, even Hume was uh, uh, kind of bothered by this. I mean, Hume was personally disoriented by the skeptical uh, implications of his own philosophy. So he said at one point, uh, uh, you know, my mind is so troubled by this, but uh, every now and then uh, I, I just have to turn away from philosophy and go play a game of backgammon. And uh, then uh, when I come back from my game of backgammon, I'm ready to resume philosophy. Uh, well, that's, a, that's an interesting kind of pragmatic way of solving philosophical problems, going to play a game of backgammon. I suppose today they play video games or some such thing. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, Hume was, was himself bothered by the, the depth of skepticism that he was reaching, that uh, he was coming close to saying, you know, we really can't know anything much, and the whole discipline of philosophy is, is really uh, uh, not worth much anymore. Kant was, however, especially bothered, uh, not entirely persuaded, but Kant was worried, you know, if, if Hume's ideas uh, become popular, uh, we won't be able to make any progress on uh, in philosophy or science. I mean, science is very important to uh, Kant. 
uh, we won't be able to make progress on science. Um, and so Kant made it his purpose to refute Hume. Kant made it his purpose to defend knowledge against skepticism. Kant made it his purpose to defend knowledge of science and mathematics particularly, but he also uh, wandered into ethics and theology and uh, any number of other subjects. So Kant is a pr tremendously important thinker, and everybody after Kant is deeply influenced by Kant. Indeed, the liberal theologians of our own time are deeply influenced by Kant. So uh, you, you can't, if you want to write a paper, you want to do some more research uh, on a philosopher, there's nobody more important than Kant. Uh, although Kant is very difficult to read. Uh, Kant was able to write uh, clearly in his essays, but uh, he, he wrote, uh, when he was over 40, he wrote this book called The Critique of Pure Reason, uh, which is a terrible book, uh, so far as its writing is concerned. He just gathered a lot of notes and scattered, scattered them together and, and got this uh, critique of pure reason. But everybody said it was such a wonderful book that after the time of Kant, everybody sort of imitated the critique of pure reason, both in style and in content. And uh, so that made a real mess of the <laughs> philosophical writing uh, tradition. But anyway, uh, it is possible to, even though it's a very obscure book, it's a very profound book, and it is possible to find out what Kant was uh, driving at, and we'll try to uh, accomplish that here. As I said uh, some time ago, the most important philosophical syntheses have been those of Plato, Ar Aristotle, Aquinas, and Kant. Kant develops the basic framework of thought, which has controlled every non-Christian philosophy and every liberal theology since his time. Kant attempts to reconcile continental rationalism with British empiricism. As an empiricist, he wants to curb the pretensions of speculative reason. So his book is called The Critique of Pure Reason, and his second book is called The Critique of Practical Reason, and uh, he also wrote a book called The Critique of Judgment. So he's a critical uh, writer. People sometimes, uh, when they don't want to use the, the name of Kant, they simply refer to the critical philosophy. That's the philosophy of Kant. Uh, as, a, as an empiricist, he wants to uh, critique the pretensions of reason, but as a rationalist, he wants to establish the certainty of knowledge in science and mathematics. See, the strength of rationalism was certainty. The strength of empiricism was criticism. And Kant wants to have both. Uh, he wants to have uh, certainty, dogmatic certainty. He wants to have certainty and also have a, uh, the ability to criticize um, ideas that are not uh, legitimate. Now, to do this, he develops, um, what's he going to do? Is he going to be a rationalist? reducing everything to mathematics? Or is he going to be an empiricist, reducing everything to sense experience? Neither one. He comes up with a third alternative, which he calls the transcendental method. Okay? Transcendental method. He rejects the mathematical method of the rationalists and the inductive introspective method of the empiricists. And he asks... What are the conditions that make experience possible? Now, we all know that we have experience. We can't doubt that. Uh, we have experience. Indeed, we have knowledge. We make judgments. And Kant takes that for granted. He's, he's a little bit like Reed here. He, he says, I'm not going to ask uh, whether knowledge is possible. Of course knowledge is possible. If it weren't possible, we wouldn't even be in this conversation, right? If it weren't possible, we, we wouldn't uh, even be engaged in, in philosophy or history or, or uh, literature or any other discipline. So we have to assume that knowledge is possible. And of course, uh, we, we can't live day by day unless knowledge is possible. But what must the world be like? <laughs> 
if knowledge is to be possible? And that's the central question for Kant. What must the world be like if knowledge is to be possible? For Kant, uh, the transcendental question reduces to another question, namely, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? Now I'm going to have to explain those terms. Synthetic a priori judgments. First, let's look at a priori. There's a philosophical distinction between a priori and a posteriori. A priori simply means what comes before. A posteriori simply means what comes after. And what comes in between these two is what we might call inquiry. This is where you ask a question and you try to come up with uh, knowledge, try to come up with information, try to come up with an answer to your question. When you engage in an inquiry, there is some knowledge that you have before the inquiry, and there's some knowledge that you get out of the inquiry that results from the inquiry. So the knowledge that you have before the inquiry, these are your assumptions, your presuppositions, the knowledge that you've got in the past that you bring to the task. That's what we call a priori knowledge, knowledge that, is, that comes before. And then you learn something from the inquiry, and uh, you record the results. And the results of your inquiry can be described as your a posteriori knowledge. Now, if you're a philosopher, of course, you ask this question in a much more radical way. And you say, is there any knowledge that, that comes absolutely before all other knowledge? Not just a, a particular inquiry but knowledge that comes before anything else. Knowledge that comes before knowledge in general. Knowledge that comes before the whole body of knowledge. Uh, now, some philosophers have said no. <laughs> Locke said, basically, there is no a priori knowledge. The mind is uh, bored with a blank slate. And the knowledge that we have all comes from experience. So all our knowledge is a posteriori. All knowledge is part of this process of inquiring and looking around and getting data from the eyes and so on and so forth. But uh, most philosophers, and this certainly includes Plato, this certainly includes Augustine, because remember Plato and Augustine believed that uh, some knowledge was innate, uh, some knowledge we're kind of born with, or at least we have the capacity to uh, get that knowledge almost immediately. Remember the slave and the Mino dialogue who uh, uh, was supposed to have knowledge of geometry in his head before he even learned it? Uh, well, that's the idea of a priori knowledge, that we have some, some knowledge in our heads before we go out and learn anything. Okay, uh, And, uh, you know... I mean, uh, in, in Christian, in Christian uh, theory of knowledge, I would say that our, our fundamental presuppositions are the a priori. That is, uh, when we go out to uh, uh, study God's world, we should be assuming God's revelation. So God's revelation is our presupposition, our a priori. And then uh, what comes out of knowledge would be our a posteriori. Well, these, these rationalists uh, all thought you have to begin somewhere. Descartes, uh, for Descartes, the uh, a priori is uh, my self-knowledge. I, I am thinking, I am doubting. Uh, and uh, uh, so I doubt, therefore I am, and so on. So you start with uh, your axioms or your, your uh, assumptions and you build the fabric of knowledge out of those. So that's the distinction between a priori and a posteriori. Now there's another distinction that Kant is interested in, and that is between analytic and synthetic. Synthetic. 
analytic knowledge and synthetic knowledge. Or we can talk about language and talk about analytic statements and synthetic statements. Analytic statements are statements that are true or false by the meanings of their words. Now, if I say, well, let's just say true. They're the statements that are true by virtue of the meanings of the words. Uh, for example, if I say a bachelor is unmarried, okay, you don't need to go out and do a Gallup poll, interview all the bachelors, are you married, are you married, are you one? No, you, you know, just by the meanings of the terms that if a person is a bachelor, he's unmarried. That is an analytic statement because we know it's true just by analyzing the meanings of the words. Okay. Now, are the berries uh, the berries are ripe? Thinking about the berry bushes in the garden. Do you know that that's true just by the meanings of the terms? You know the meaning of the term berry. You know the meaning of the term ripe. Do you know by meanings of the terms whether the berries are ripe? No. You've got to go out and look. Okay. Uh, you've got you've got to go and, and have some experience and find out because that that sentence could be true or false. Bachelor is is married has to be true. It couldn't possibly be false. But the berries are ripe. That could be true or it could be false. You have to go and look. So that that's a synthetic statement where the predicate ripe adds something to the subject berries. Uh, bachelor is unmarried. Unmarried doesn't add anything to the meaning of the subject. Uh, the predicate is included in the subject. In the synthetic statement, the predicate adds something to the subject. And so you can tell the truth of an analytic statement just by looking at the meanings of the words, uh, but you can't tell the meaning of a synthetic statement by looking at the meanings of the words. Okay, now, in David Hume's philosophy, and this is also true of uh, logical positivism in the 20th century, it's uh, true of a number of thinkers, uh, there's a rough correlation between a priori and analytic and between a posteriori and synthetic. Uh, analytic statements are a priori, okay? If I say the bachelor is unmarried, you know that before any experience, right? And you don't have to go around serving, surveying bachelors in order to find that that's true. Uh, analytic a priori. Uh, if I say the berries are ripe, that uh, is, is an a, priori, a posteriori statement because you get that from going out in the garden and looking. You don't get that from the language, you get that from, from going out in the garden and looking. So it's kind of plausible, and some, some philosophers have taken this point of view, to say that all a priori knowledge is analytic, uh, can be expressed in analytic statements, and all a posteriori are, uh, knowledge um, can be expressed in synthetic statements. And of course, uh, all synthetic statements are a posteriori, all analytic statements are a priori. Now Kant is going to break that rule, all right? And it's very important to Kant that we are able to break this rule. Kant believes that there are some statements that are synthetic and a priori, okay? Synthetic and a priori. Um, see why that's important? Kant is saying that, that contrary to Hume, there are some things that we know that are factual statements about the world, that, that are not just about language, but factual statements about the world that we know before any kind of experience. One of them is uh, every event has a cause. 
Okay? How do you know that that's true? You can't know that that's true just by virtue of the language. It's not analytic. But you know that before you go into uh, any kind of research. It's, a, it's an assumption. It's a presupposition. Here Kant's a little bit like Thomas Reed, isn't he? He's assuming that there's some factual things that we know before we go into any kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, study. Nothing can be both red and blue all over at the same time, all right? <laughs> now, is that, what is that? Is that a, an analytic statement? Can you tell that that's true just by the meaning of blue? Uh, and by the meaning of red, was, were those the two colors, red and blue, uh, and same time? Um, well, a lot of people, some people would say yes, some people would say no. But that's the kind of argument that you get into. Kant, at least, would say that that is also synthetic a priori. You know that that's true, but you can't absolutely prove uh, prove it by uh, some uh, some means uh, other than uh, what we're talking about here. Well, um, let's see if I've covered everything in my outline at this point. Um, go, go down to 1D on page 53. Let me make sure that I've got that for you here. Yes, D, knowing synthetic a priori judgments. Knowing synthetic a priori judgments requires intuition. This is an important term for Kant. I'm not entirely sure what it means, but he refers to it a lot. Intuition. Intuition usually, uh, in my vocabulary, if you know something but you don't know how you know it, you say, I know it by intuition. It's one of those kind of weasel words uh, of which philosophy abounds. But uh, visualize a cube, okay? And uh, as you visualize it, you know that it must have 12 edges, all right? Now, that's not part of the definition of a cube, is it? Or is it? Uh, a cube is a... Is a uh, geometrical, a solid geometrical figure that has, uh, has uh, uh, squares on each side uh, and so on. I imagine there's more than one way to define it because it has certain properties. It has a, a perfect square on each face and it has, uh, uh, what, uh, six faces and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, however you define it, it, it turns out and you make some deductions and you do some visualizations and you find out that it must have 12 edges. Uh, is this a priori? Well, um, it, it's, it's not like the intuition is like another sense conforming to its object. So Kant supposes that the reverse is true that the object conforms to the intuition. Now, this is an important development in Kant. Uh, the, uh, Kant says that the human mind, the intuition specifically, creates the structure of experience. And this is revolutionary. And everybody else, the rationalists, the empiricists, basically go with this model. You know, here's me. Here's the world. And uh, the world kind of imposes itself on me. I get knowledge in my head because of the world, of the way the world is. Now, what Kant is saying is that, to a large extent, 
it works the other way. The mind imposes a certain order on experience. And much of the structure of experience is there not because of something in the world, but because of something in us. Here's a parable that, that I've found helpful. I don't know where it comes from. I, I think it may have come from Gordon Clark. I, I, I don't know. But uh, uh, imagine that there are, uh, there's a shelf down in your cellar of jelly jars, okay, jars that are filled with jelly. And they're all cylindrical, okay? And they're intelligent, right? Intelligent jelly jars. They're not only intelligent, but they're philosophical jelly jars. And uh, they spend their time discussing this philosophical problem. Why is it that jelly, when it's poured into us, always takes a cylindrical shape? And some of the jelly jars are scientific, and they examine the chemicals, and they examine the, the properties of the jelly, and, uh, uh, and they... Uh, they don't find anything. You know, they don't find anything about jelly that forces it into a cylindrical shape. And they, they battle about this for days and months and so on and so forth. And finally, there's this one very intelligent jelly jar. This is Immanuel Kant. There's an intelligent jelly jar who says, consider this, that the reason why the jelly takes a cylindrical shape is because that's our shape. The jelly is conforming to us, and that's why it takes the shape that it does. This is what Kant says about experience. Experience is the way it is, not because of something in the experience, but because that's the way we are. Why is it that you have a sequence of cause and effects uh, David Hume looked at the looked at the looked at billiard balls and <laughs> looked at causes and effects, and he didn't uh, see anything that uh, any kind of necessity in the relationship between a cause and the effect. Kant says that necessity is there, but it's not because of something out there. It's because of something in here. It's not because the uh, billiard uh, of anything in the billiards it's because of the structure that my mind places on that experience my mind puts everything into a causal order and that's why there's a necessary relationship between cause and effect so by recognizing the activity of the mind Kant is able to save science Science is based on cause and effect. Science is based on finding causes for things. And so uh, uh, Kant is able to say, yes, there is a necessary relationship between cause and effect, but that necessary relationship is the product of mind. Well, that's very exciting. And how very modern this is, all right? Uh, recognizing that the human being is the center, uh, that human subjectivity is the center. We've, we've seen this develop already with Kant, uh, with Hume talking about custom, and with Thomas Reed talking about uh, kind of pragmatism and our common sense beliefs. And now Kant comes along and says the very structure of, of, of reality comes out of the human mind. It's not imposed on the human mind from outside. It's something that the human mind imposes on its own experience. Now, that's a truly remarkable thing. And you see autonomy. Uh, you see man becoming the authority for all meaning. Now man is the source of all meaning. Man becomes like God. That's what happens in Kant's philosophy. Man takes on the role of God in traditional religion and traditional philosophy. And look what happens. I mean, compare Kant to Plato, for example, or Aristotle. 
Plato distinguished between the forms and the matter. Matter is the raw stuff that everything's made of. Form is the structure. Now, Plato felt that this matter was unknowable and you can't really say anything much about it. And, and it really is unreal in a sense because matter is unformed, matter is unshaped. It's the form that provides the structure. Now for Plato, the form is in a world up there. For Aristotle, the form is in this world down here. For Kant, where is it? For Kant, the form is in here. The form of everything, the structure of everything, comes from the human mind. What, what he's saying here is that the, there's some knowledge that we have in the mind that is prior to any knowledge that we gain from the world. And furthermore, some of this knowledge is knowledge that the mind imposes upon the world. Now, that's very odd. That's very counterintuitive. But uh, why should I believe that that parable fits me? Why should I believe that that, that parable uh, has any relevance to the human quest for knowledge? Well, here we get into uh, capital C, which is Kant's basic distinction. Kant's basic distinction between the phenomena and the noumena. All right? So uh, Kant, uh, just as Plato distinguished between a world of forms and a world of matter, Kant distinguishes a world called the noumena and a world called the phenomena. Now the noumena are the sometimes called the things in themselves or the ding on sich in German. The noumenal world, the things in themselves, are reality as it really is, apart from our experience of it. Uh, noumena is the real world. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's the real world apart from appearances. You know, all through the history of philosophy, people have been trying to distinguish between appearances and reality. Uh, what, uh, of all the things in my mind, what are appearances and what is true knowledge? And basically what Kant says is that the true knowledge, the, the true world as it really is, apart from my thoughts, apart from any experience of it, I can't, uh, that, that's the noumenal world, and I can't know it. I, I can't know what the world really is. I can't know... Uh, reality in and of itself. We know that there is such a thing, we know that there is a noumenal world, but we can have no knowledge of the noumenal world beyond that. By definition, the noumenal world is what the world is beyond our experience. And we can't know the world beyond our experience. We can only uh, know what we experience of the world. And that's essentially Hume's position, and at this point, Kant basically accepts Hume's skepticism. In fact, he even goes beyond Hume's skepticism. He says we can't know anything of the real world. We can't know anything of the world as it exists beyond our experience. Total skepticism uh, as to what is finally true. This is what I would call the irrational side of Kant. Now you remember my rectangle with uh, irrationalism on the upper right corner and rationalism on the lower right corner. And when Kant talks about the noumenal world, he's uh, talking about the limitations of knowledge, the limitations of reason. And he's very radical in saying that reason has no access to the truth. So here's uh, uh, irrationalism in, in a very strong sense with Kant. Uh, 
But there's also a rational side, a rationalistic side of Kant. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, that has to do with the phenomenal world. The phenomenal world is the world as it appears to us. The phenomenal world is the world that we experience. And within this phenomenal world, reason is fully competent. In fact, it may attain certainty. Uh, this is Kant's rationalistic side. Here, Kant uh, reverses Plato. Let me get the right page up here for you. This is the phenomenal world in which reason is fully competent. That is, we, we, we are perfectly competent to know our experience, to understand our experience. And within the area of experience, reason is fully competent. It may attain certainty. It's interesting that uh, Kant almost reverses Plato. Uh, for Plato, the material world is down here. And it can't be understood. Matter is constantly changing, constantly flowing around. It's imperfect, it's muddy, it's filthy. And you can't really know it. Uh, you can only know the forms, which are the perfect, abstract, changeless uh, uh, archetypes of matter. Uh, the forms are up there, matter is down here. Now what Kant is saying, Kant has a similar distinction and when we think of Kant's noumenal, we think of it as up there. When we think of Kant's phenomenal, we think of it as down here. But for Kant, it's, it's the noumenal that we can't know. The noumenal is really like Plato's matter. And the phenomena is the world that we have structured. It's the world that the jelly jar has formed to be cylindrical. It's the world that we have uh, impose the forms with our mind, uh, the forms of cause and effect, and singularity and plurality and so on. And that's what we know. So it's almost as if the, what Plato thought of as the world of forms is down here. And what Plato thought of as the world of matter, the unknowable world of matter, is what Kant puts up there. So Kant kind of reverses uh, the structure of Plato's uh, universe. Uh, Plato's forms down here, uh, Plato's matter uh, up there. Well, let's think a little bit more about the phenomenal world. Uh, <clears throat> for Plato, the world of experience was the world of mere opinion. In another world, the world of the supremely real forms was the real world of certain knowledge. The structure of the phenomenal world, in fact, for Kant, is not only apprehended by the mind, but contributed by the mind. Uh, the <clears throat> so, wh where do the forms come from? Uh, Plato didn't know. For Plato, it was mysterious. For Augustine, the forms come from God. For Augustine, the forms are in the mind of God. For Kant, the forms, <laughs> the forms of experience are in the mind of man. You see how Kant exchanges man for God, here and in many other parts of his philosophy. Let's talk about how the mind imposes structure on the world. Kant... Uh, understands this kind of like a, a, an assembly line, almost. We have uh, several stages. Let's say we have raw data. The, the sort of like Hume, what Hume called impressions. Uh, and this basically comes from the noumenal world. This comes from the real world. But that real world has to come into our mind before we can experience it. So we don't know the real world. We don't know the noumenal. We don't know the raw data 
We only know these as they come into our minds and the mind processes them. Now, Kant wasn't the first person to say that, you know. Uh, Aristotle talked about uh, the active intellect, which uh, takes the data of the senses and reworks it and shapes it and so on and so forth. What Kant is doing is showing us how the mind shapes the noumenal data. Now, it's sort of like uh, I mentioned assembly line. This is kind of like one of those movies that they showed you back in grade school where you'd watch a candy bar being made, you know, the, the, the peanuts would be coming in through one, uh, one feeder, and then, there was a, and then there's nougat, and then there's chocolate, and then there's a wrapper, and each stage they go through, and each machine uh, plops a new ingredient on the candy bar, and by the time you know it, it comes out, and it's all wrapped up, and it's a candy bar. But uh, you start off with the raw stuff, at one end, the, the, the peanuts and the chocolate and the nougat, and uh, uh, gradually it, uh, one thing is added and another thing is added until you get to the end of the assembly line and there's the complete candy bar. Well, Kant has something like that. At least that's a, a, a neat analogy, a way of thinking about Kant's, uh, Kant's work. Uh, the first, uh, struck, uh, the first um, step in the assembly line is what he calls the uh, transcendental aesthetic. Transcendental aesthetic. And what happens at that stage is that the raw material is uh, arranged in a time-space sequence. A transcendental aesthetic deals with sense experience and with our intuition of uh, objects. And we see objects in time and in space. Sense experience is possible because the mind contributes a spatio-temporal order in which the raw data of sensation are placed. So, but, but it's the mind that does this, you see. It's the mind that takes these data and puts them in space and in time. So when we experience reality, it comes to us bit by bit. It doesn't come to us all at once. It comes to us at a particular time, comes to us in particular geographical locations. And why is that? Well, it's not because the, new wor uh, the, the noumenal world is temporal or spatial. It comes because that's the grid that our mind imposes on it. It's like the the ice cube tray. It's like the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, grid that, the, uh, uh, that we put in an ice cube tray to uh, make our ice uh, take a, a cubical shape. Uh, well, the, as you move along this assembly line, the uh, mind uh, takes the raw data and puts them into a spatio and a temporal shape. Then the next stage see things proceed. Here's the assembly line. Now it moves on to the next stage, which is the transcendental analytic. And here the mind shapes the raw data uh, into concepts. Uh, the, this, uh, the first stage has to do with sen sensation this has to do with understanding, a higher level of knowledge. And uh, here we have concepts. Remember how Thomas Reed said that the mind uh, uh, in, brings, uh, uh, forms concepts of the things that it knows. Uh, here we have concepts that unite particulars together under common features. In Kant's view, all knowledge requires both sense experience and Concepts. Kant says that uh, uh, that uh, thoughts without um, content are empty. Um, intuitions without concepts are blind. Uh, intuitions without concepts are blind. In other words, if we just saw blue shapes and and loud noises, we wouldn't know what they are. Uh, it's at this point where we determine what they are. Uh, so you need both uh, this and this in order to form knowledge. Uh, 
Well, uh, at the transcendental analytic stage, understanding is possible because the mind contributes the categories by which sense experience can be rationally analyzed. Categories such as substance, unity, plurality, causality, possibility. Uh, that is to say, the mind produces the laws of nature. Concepts, laws of nature. Uh, so, uh, you know, Kant basically says that percepts without concepts are meaningless. Concepts without percepts uh, have no content to them. So you need both of these if you're going to have knowledge, if you're going to have understanding, not only sensation, but also uh, understanding. Now, uh, these, these come together, and then there's still a third, a third stage, which Kant calls the transcendental unity of the apperception. Kant never uses a simple expression uh, where he can use a, a technical expression. Uh, the, the transcendental unity of the apperception is the subjective side of it all. We, we have here the sensations, we have here the understanding, and here we have the knower. Remember I told you before that in all knowledge you have, uh, you have norms, you have objects, and you have the uh, knower. This is the subjective side. This is the existential perspective. Uh, if you want, the, this is the transcendental analytic. This is the transcendental. Uh, 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 this is the transcendental aesthetic. This is the transcendental analytic, with the rules and the concepts. And this is the subjective. This is the transcendental unity of the apperception. The uh, previous two steps presuppose that all categories are manifestations of a single synthesis, a single unification of experience. I can have concepts because I can apprehend multiple representations in my mind at the same time. So <clears throat> what this means is you, you've got to have a mind in order to sense things, in order to analyze and understand things, you've got to have a mind. You've got to, to have a knower. You've got to have somebody who, uh, who uh, carries on the work of knowledge. So therefore, cause, well, just take cause and effect, which is one of these uh, concepts, one of these categories. Why is it that con cause and effect are invariably conjoined? We want to say they're necessarily conjoined, although Hume said, I don't see that. I don't see how they're necessarily conjoined. Kant says, you know, it's part of our intuition. We, we know that they're necessarily conjoined. That's a, an example of a synthetic a priori truth. We know that they're necessarily conjoined. Uh, not because there's some natural, some mysterious power in the natural world that connects the cause with the effect. We don't know what's in the natural world. Uh, we don't really know what's back there. But because the mind inevitably arranges all experience in causal order. The jelly has a cylindrical shape, spherical shape, <clears throat> not because of some property of the jelly, but because of the shape of the jar. Since, however, all structure to knowledge is contributed by the mind, the mind really knows only itself. You remember Plato said the only things that are knowable are forms, not matter. This is matter. This is the raw data. And we really don't, don't know that. This is like Plato's matter. These are all Plato's forms. So what we know is only what our mind contributes. What we know 
is only our mind. What we know is only ourselves. We become like Aristotle's God who is engaged in thought, thinking, thought. All, right? All knowledge is self-knowledge. And that, uh, of course, is very problematic. I mean, our, uh, we have to be skeptical about everything except knowing ourselves. In the article, when the oracle said to Socrates, know thyself, <laughs> that phrase takes on a real uh, deeper meaning in connection with Kant's thought. Uh, well, uh, so, so Kant is very deeply skeptical, really. Uh, he, he deceives us into thinking that we're knowing something by, by funneling all of this through this mental process. All we know is our own thought. All we know is our own mental process. Okay, now uh, let's look at some other things that Kant has to say. Kant uh, is uh, critical of metaphysics. Remember, metaphysics is the attempt through philosophy to understand the uh, basic features of the universe. And you can tell that Kant, because he believes the noumenal is unknowable, he's going to be very skeptical about metaphysics. He's going to say that through philosophy we can't know the structure of the world. We can't know anything about the world. And so uh, we can predict this. In Kant's view, the mind errs whenever it attempts to make judgments about matters beyond experience, that is, about the noumenal world. Now there's a section in Kant's critique where he talks about the transcendental dialectic, all right? And you might think that this is another stage in the, the assembly line, transcendental dialectic, but it's not a stage in the assembly line. For Kant, this is something bad, all right? <laughs> this is deceitfulness. Uh, this is something that we should not engage in. This is not part of the road to knowledge. Um, the, the transcendental dialectic occurs, and by the way, the, the word dialectic simply means uh, uh, a, a kind of critical exchange of ideas. Uh, Plato's dialogues were called dialectic because you'd have different views being exchanged back and forth. Uh, we'll see later that Hegel's uh, uh, philosophy is called dialectical because uh, uh, you have a positive idea going up against a negative idea and the two, or the clash of the two leads to a, a higher idea. Well, uh, Kant is not quite that sophisticated, but his idea of a dialectic is that uh, <clears throat> you have a kind of self-contradiction that occurs. Uh, a clash of two ideas that uh, leads you to a contradiction and therefore to no knowledge at all, all right? That's the nature of the transcendental dialectic. Now, the dialectic includes several subforms. One is the paralogism. Uh, Kant thinks that when you try to argue for an immortal immaterial soul, uh, you are committing a fallacy, which he calls a paralogism. Now you remember, this is a subject that's come up often in philosophy, the soul. Remember, Augustine, God and the soul, that's what I want. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Descartes, uh, uh, I think. Therefore, I am the soul and uh, God. The soul is the first thing that I know. But Hume looks around and he doesn't find any soul. All right? Barclay looks around and he says everything is soul. <laughs> uh, Hume can't find the soul. Now, Kant, you might say, has a kind of soul here, this transcendental unity of the apperception. That is the idea that all of this uh, perceiving and reasoning, it all has to find uh, a location in a mind somewhere. But Kant is very careful about this. 
He doesn't want to say that the transcendental unity of the apperception is immortal, okay, or that it is immaterial. He doesn't want to make any metaphysical judgments or offer any metaphysical descriptions of that. And he thinks that when people try to do that, uh, they confuse different senses of self. What do you mean by self? Is the self simply the mind that receives knowledge, like the transcendental unity of the apperception? Or is the mind somehow a, an immaterial soul that uh, operates uh, inside the body, and there's some kind of problem about how the mind and the body interact? Uh, well, Kant says uh, uh, there, there is no way of proving that kind of immaterial, immortal soul. B, arguments, uh, when you get into an argument about whether the uni uni universe uh, <clears throat> has a, a, a rational structure, well, you can argue that that's, that's the case, and you can also argue that it's not the case. And uh, both of those arguments are equally good, okay? You can prove that the world had a beginning in time, as Thomas, well, no, Thomas didn't. <laughs> you can argue that the world had a beginning in time, like the Muslim Kalam cosmological argument does. Or you can argue that it doesn't have a beginning in time, the way Aristotle did. Both of those arguments, according to Kant, both of those arguments are equally good, uh, equally sound, equally persuasive. You can argue that the world had a beginning. You can argue that the world doesn't have a beginning. And what do you do when you get into that kind of position where you have a, an argument uh, on, uh, for A and an equally good argument for not A? Well, you conclude that you're, you're going into forbidden territory. Um, you can prove that bodies are infinitely divisible or that they're not infinitely divisible. Well, since you can argue either way, you know that your mind is getting into forbidden territory. You're trying to reason beyond the level of your experience. You've never divide, you've never tried to divide a body infinitely. <laughs> you've never seen what happens when you try to divide a body infinitely. So just leave off of it, you know. Don't, don't try to explore that kind of thing. You can prove that there is free will, says Kant, or you can prove that all is determined. And Kant's conclusion is that uh, neither conclusion is right, and you just have to give up on that whole idea, because that's beyond anything we can experience. Or you can prove that there's an absolutely necessary being. God, okay. Remember how Aquinas, uh, Aquinas' third proof of the existence of God uh, uh, proved God from the contingency of the world? Well, Kant says that goes beyond our experience. We can't know whether the world, the whole world, the whole universe, we can't know whether the whole universe is contingent or whether the whole universe is, is necessary. So... Uh, Stay away from antinomies. Stay away from paralogisms. And along the way, Kant discusses uh, the other common arguments for the existence of God. He says that the teleological argument is the most persuasive. He kind of likes the idea that you look up in the sky and you see the stars and you ask yourself, uh, you know, you say to yourself, somebody must have made this. I mean, this seems to have a purpose, it seems to have a structure, but you can't really make that into an argument. It doesn't prove anything. It kind of impresses the mind, but it doesn't prove anything. And he says the cosmological uh, rests on the ontological argument, and then he says the ontological argument is worthless because he has the theory that uh, existence is not a perfection, Existence is not even a predicate, says Kant. Uh, I'm not going to take time with that now. Uh, I think Kant is way off the track on that point, but uh, 
Uh, that's uh, something that he says about the ontological argument. The conclusion, he doesn't think you can prove the existence of God the way Thomas Aquinas did, um, or the way Descartes did, or the way any of the rationalists did. So stay away from metaphysics, although metaphysics does have some legitimate use. What caught, Here again he makes another distinction. Metaphysics does not have a constitutive use, but it has a regulative use. The constitutive use is to try to prove the existence of things. Free will, God, universal structure. Uh, that, that, that's what metaphysicians try to do to prove that certain things exist. Kant says you can't do that. But metaphysics does have a regulative use. What does that mean? A regulative use is what governs our behavior. A regulative use is what governs our habits, the way we perceive things, the way we do things. And here again, you see, since, since the time of uh, Pascal, since the time of, uh, of Butler, we find pragmatism entering in. I think Thomas Reed does this somewhat. Uh, we, we find uh, an emphasis on uh, uh, the practical use of ideas. And uh, so Pascal's wager, for example. Uh, what, what Kant says is that the notion of an ultimate structure in the world is useful for our scientific methodology, whether it's true or not. See, we don't know whether the universe has a general structure to it. But if you're going to be a scientist, you're better off believing that it does have a general structure because that's the structure that science investigates. Now, science needs to have some subject matter, obviously. And, uh, you know, if you say that there is no structure, then you give up on science entirely. So if you're going to do science, it's best that you uh, <clears throat> start with the presupposition that the universe is an orderly place. Now, that's not constitutive. You can't prove that the universe is an orderly place. But it's good to regulate your behavior. You act as if. You experiment as if the world is, a, is a, uh, an orderly place. So this presupposition uh, prods us to keep on looking for higher and higher causes. What about, what about God? What about the existence of God? According to Kant, we don't know that there's a God. There may be a God, there may not be a God. But it's useful to believe in God. It's a helpful doctrine to believe in God. There's pragmatic value in believing in God. The notions of God and the soul contribute to our thinking about physics and psychology. To, to believe that the universe is an orderly place is to believe that somebody has ordered it, somebody has structured it, somebody has made it what it is. And so believing in God helps you as a scientist. You think, think of yourself as exploring God's mind. Same thing for the soul. You don't know whether you have a soul, but uh, if you're going to be a psychologist, <laughs> it's better to, to believe that you have a soul. I mean, it helps you in your investigations. So we ought to assume that certain things are true of the noumenal world, even though we can't establish their truthfulness by experience. God, freedom, and immortality also should be presupposed for the sake of moral decision-making. Okay? Uh, if you're trying to be a moral person, you ought to assume that you're free. Now, you don't know whether you're free or not, but uh, it's best to assume that you're free because at least Kant thought that if you believe you're free, you take responsibility. And it's good, if you're trying to be a moral person, it's good to... Uh, 
believe in God because uh, God is the one who establishes the moral law and God is the one who promises rewards for good behavior and punishments for bad behavior. And that encourages you uh, in your moral, in your, in your uh, quest for moral perfection. So this is the regulative use of metaphysical ideas. Now, notice my comment there under C. Uh, my view is that if we are really to act as if God exists, must we not, among other things, believe that he really exists and obey his revelation? I mean, if we were uh, just supposing that God exists and acting as if God exists, shouldn't we also think as though God exists? I think one big mistake that philosophers are always making is assuming that thought is different somehow from all the other actions that we perform. That thought is not an action, or thought is in some different category. It seems to me now, here, here's Kant telling us we should act as if God exists. Shouldn't he also then tell us to think as though God exists? <clears throat> and if we think as though God exists, why shouldn't we actually believe that God exists. Well, uh, Kant fails to see that, though. Uh, he urges us to act as if God exists, but only in certain very artificially compartmentalized areas of life. 